Hey there, I'm Kyle Dickinson. I'm with the AWS Customer Incident Response Team. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about the lessons learned from the front lines of incident response. We're gonna cover who we are, why we are here, common causes for a customer security event, security patterns to reduce customer risks, and then where to go next. Who is the Customer Incident Response Team? Well, we are a team that comprises of professional service security consultants and solution architects that help the customers on the customer side of the shared responsibility model for active security events. We'll support our customers with active triage and recovery. We'll assist in root cause analysis and log analysis within AWS service logs, including CloudTrail, VPC flow logs, Route 53 resolver logs, as well as provide recommendations for our customers to recover long-term after their security event. The reason we are here is because customers are challenged with 24 seven security event prevention, detection, analysis, and response to a security event. And customers are seeking the right AWS skill sets and knowledge along with best practices to address their security response needs. So we are here because we want to share our experiences to see our customers excel in preventing and detecting events within the cloud. Looking at the AWS shared responsibility model, we have security in the cloud, which is managed by customers, and then security of the cloud, which is managed by AWS. Now, when we look at it from a service by service perspective, we also have varying responsibility. So within infrastructure services, thinking EC2, the customer is responsible from the operating system upwards. Then we have container services, and this isn't exactly Docker or Kubernetes, but where AWS handles the operating system and the platform running on it. And then lastly, we look at abstracted services, where the customer needs to decide where the data goes, who has access to it, whether client-side data encryption is enabled. And the reason why we want to look at these as a varying responsibility as well is because the log output for each service will vary depending on the service utilized. So it's a good practice to understand what logging is available for the services that are gonna be utilized within your organization. When we look at the different customer responsibilities, we want to highlight some of the most important ones, such as all activities that occur within your account are your responsibility, including unauthorized access. And we'll talk about root cause for common security events later and how to prevent these, uh, but just understanding that uh, this is on the customer side of the shared responsibility model. The customer is also responsible for properly configuring and leveraging an AWS service. Second, we also want to keep in mind that keeping the AWS root account email current for notifications is a customer responsibility, and then taking appropriate actions to secure, protect, and back up your account data and content, as well as not disclosing login credentials and access keys to unauthorized parties. Different methods that we could look at for different resources uh, to assist customers in helping to respond to security events is look, found in the incident response methodology or the AWS Security Incident Response Guide. And this allows you to review steps that we take at AWS, such as preparing and preventing, detect and assess impact, triage recovery, and investigating the root cause. This guide is packed full of information and helps with the framework of how to address security events within AWS to enable your security teams. Now, more prescriptively, within the AWS customer response framework, which is available on GitHub, we have a collection of files that provide as an example framework uh, for you to create, develop, and integrate different security playbooks in preparation for potential security events when using AWS services. We have templates available for compromised IAM credentials, denial of service, inappropriate public resources, thinking 
S3 and RDS, unauthorized network changes, Bitcoin and crypto, uh, crypto jacking, as well as responding to ransom within AWS. Another tool we have available is Assisted Log Enabler, and this tool allows you to review your account to see what service level logging is not enabled and enable it. And taking it a step further, it supports multi-account mode utilizing AWS organizations. And so if you need to in, uh, enable VPC flow logs, CloudTrail, EK Audis, Audit and Authenticator logs, or Route 53 Resolver logs, uh, this tool will allow you to enable those and at scale as well. Furthering to enable the logging sources that can be reviewed for analysis, we have the Security Analytics Bootstrap, uh, which is a quick setup method to configure Athena, which creates a fully configured analysis environment, as well as example Athena queries. And when we look at larger data sets, since Athena is utilizing S3 as its data source, we're able to partition the data by the account ID, uh, the date, and this is very useful for when we have centralized logging for CloudTrail, uh, if your organization is configured that way. So you're not analyzing all of the accounts CloudTrail logs, we're looking at a particular set. Now, common use cases for uh, this analytics bootstrap are for if you want to search AWS logs natively within AWS, uh, if for some reason you don't have a seam available or accessible, uh, you need to search logs beyond seam retention periods, uh, or the AWS service logs are not indexed within the seam. This is also useful for accounts that have not been onboarded into your organization, but are within your responsibility. Uh, you're able to query these logs natively within that account without relying on exporting them into a different tool. So a quote that uh, resonates quite a bit is Gartner estimates that the most cloud security failures will be on the user customer side of the shared responsibility model. And I wanna cover the different common causes for customer security events. The first one being inaccurate AWS account information. So when configuring an AWS account, an email is required. And for the root account, some may use a single email address. Some may use a alias that's resolvable to a distribution list. What we want to ensure is that we have good account hygiene, because if there's a communication that needs to go from AWS to the account owner, that it doesn't go to an unmonitored mailbox or to a mailbox for to an individual that you know, may be on vacation or may not be with the organization anymore. This is very important. And taking it a step further, there is a way to populate alternate contacts now programmatically, including the security alternate contact, which is advisable to have a distribution list that goes to the security team should an outbound communication regarding a security concern about your account need to be sent to you. Another common cause is insecure AWS resource configurations. Uh, common things we could think of here is a security group permitting access from the entire internet to sensitive ports such as uh, SSH or RDP, uh, SMB file systems. What we want to make sure is that administrative ports on an EC2 instance, for example, are locked down or scoped to a particular range and not the entire internet. Because I always joke around saying I once figured out how the internet works. Well, once we put something on the internet, we open it to be able to be scanned if we're not restricting or scoping down that access. Unattended disclosure of security credentials and secrets. So an access key or a secret uh, accidentally being published to a code repository or being discovered on a uh, workstation, we want to ensure that we have mechanisms in place that uh, prevent these disclosure of security credentials and secrets. Other things to look at is 
how is the root account secured? Do we have multi-factor authentication enabled on the root account? Is the root account uh, password strong enough? Is the root account being utilized for day-to-day -day administrative activities? Which we can argue is not the right of way to go about administration because the root account permits all actions available. And the amount of use cases that the root account is required for are dwindling day by day. Looking at other common causes, we have ineffective response to AWS guard duty or other detective controls. We can have detective controls enabled that will alert us when something is strange or not really something that would be common in our environment. However, what we want to make sure is that these are actionable alerts that are going to a team or to some sort of system that will alert the appropriate team that they need to respond to an interesting finding. One thing we also want to be cautious of is that, you know, we're not just setting and forgetting our uh, alerts. So we want to make sure that we're tuning these alerts that apply specifically to our organization and our use cases that we have so that the more important higher impact alerts are being floated to the top and being addressed as soon as possible. Looking at lack of continuous vulnerability management as well also coincides with unmanaged application software security. So if we don't have an inventory of what software is running within our environment or approved operating systems that can be utilized within our environment, we're going to have a hard time ensuring that we have the latest patch levels or that a security flaw that was discovered and published uh, does not impact us negatively. And so when we look at continuous vulnerability management, uh, there's tools such as Inspector to help look at the CVEs associated um, with a particular uh, piece of software. And there's ways to accomplish this and address it quickly, but we want to ensure that we don't have this problem at scale and that these issues are being addressed as they are released. Then looking at unmanaged application software security, uh, again, going back to vulnerability management as well, if we're creating our own applications, are we ensuring that the libraries that are being utilized uh, don't have any uh, issues with them as far as security goes? Are we ensuring that we're mitigating the OWASP top 10 for web applications, which are things that should be mitigated, especially if it's going to be something that is going to be consumed publicly, so we don't have an entryway um, for a threat actor to come into our environment. But then also, how do we do some sort of scanning as part of our software security so we don't have an example of unattended disclosure of security credentials when that application is published? So ways that we can address these different common events are with implementation goals and objectives. So if we look at this scenario-driven guidance for these common root causes, these are tied to real-world security events that have been experienced. So these aren't fictional in any means. And we're going to provide you some prescriptive guidance on how to prevent and detect these by each root cause. And the way we're going to do that is looking at the different core AWS services and service tools that can be introduced to help prevent and detect these common root causes. Starting with insecure AWS resource configurations. So we have a way to enable public block access for supported AWS services. Uh, thinking of S3, there's a way to, at the account level, block public access. Now, if you have use cases where you need to have an S3 bucket publicly accessible, there's other ways to address that. However, off the cuff, we want to look at how can we prevent someone from accidentally making something publicly accessible. We want to configure backups and validate our resource using a service like AWS Backup, specifically and especially for critical resources and data. We also want to practice least privilege when it comes to IAM principles and roles to manage. And also what access is available to our private VPCs and are we segmenting 
our resources within public VPCs versus private? Or is there just one flat network that doesn't separate the different layers of our application? There's also uh, capabilities within AWS organizations, such as security control policies, that allow us to restrict particular actions. And things we could look at is modify, delete AWS resource changes to only system administrator roles. And then we could also restrict access key usage based on policy conditions, such as source IP addresses. Now ways to detect this, enabling Security Hub for all regions and with the AWS Foundational Security Best Practices, detect common AWS resource misconfigurations. And if you're utilizing AWS organizations, this can be enabled at an organizational level and then proactively enabled as new accounts are created and onboarded to that AWS organization. Prioritizing guard duty anomalous behavior findings for unexpected resource changes as well. If you know that you have some sort of change advocacy board and you see unknown changes or unauthorized changes, this should immediately give us a red flag indicating that something is anomalous here. Services like AWS Config help us record and build a inventory. And it also gives us a point in time of different resource configurations, as well as the resources by name and the different service that it's utilizing. Moving on to unattended disclosure of security credentials and secrets. Requiring MFA for most sensitive operations and privileged access. One thing that comes in mind is if you're utilizing S3 as an object store for critical business data or data that can be impactful to your organization if it was accidentally deleted, enabling multi-factor delete after enabling versioning is one of those sensitive actions that comes to mind immediately. Disabling and deleting all AWS account root access keys so once a AWS account is created, that root account will have access keys. We want to ensure that we go in and delete those access keys. Now, understanding that, you know, some applications may require long-term access tokens, we want to strive towards using temporary role-based access over static credentials and keys. And what do I mean by that? As an example, if a application has the ability to call the STS service to obtain an access key, a secret, and a session for it to then interact with the AWS API, then that's a win. If it's required to use long-term access tokens that are tied to an IAM user, we want to find a way to strive towards utilizing temporary role-based access, given that if there's an active security event that involves that application and it is using long-term keys, that's introducing additional risk that we want to mitigate sooner than later. Using services like Secret Manager to vault and audit the use of non-IAM credentials and secrets, given its auditability and ability to rotate these secrets as well. And then using these different types of base policies for these privileged access to reduce the impact of unattended disclosure and access. Ways to detect these types of issues for this particular root cause is monitoring identity behavioral changes recorded in CloudTrail events. So other things to think about are also guard duty IAM findings. CloudTrail insights can also alert you for unusual events. And then creating more granular IAM policies and reevaluating IAM principal usage to reduce the overprivileged access impact. So if we have a role with a policy attached, we want to ensure that we are on a cadence evaluating that policy to ensure that it's not over permissioned. And we have different services that enable us to do that. Now, we also want to make sure that we're monitoring our AWS uh, email addresses that are associated with our account, the root account, or the security alternate account for notifications of credentials that have been po possibly committed to a code repository or IAM users. 
Now, implementing application security scanning for static credentials and secrets to reduce disclosure. So if we think about the uh, DevOps lifecycle, there's ways to introduce security at each layer of that lifecycle. And there's ways to prevent these secrets from being committed to a code repository. We want to ensure that we have those mechanisms in place to prevent this type of unattended disclosure. So I mentioned tools of ways to uh, evaluate for least privileged access. So IAM Access Advisor uh, is enabled per IAM principle by default within the IAM service. And it allows us to review which AWS services have been used. Taking it uh, a step further, the analyzer allows us to generate a policy based on the CloudTrail API calls that have been utilized by that principle. And then from there, generates a suggested IAM possible uh, policy from evaluation to use. So if we have a role that has been out there for say 90 days, and we want to tighten down the permissions and scrub away what has not been used, we can generate a policy for this role to utilize using this analyzer results. Now, when we look at ineffective response to guard duty and other detective controls, I mentioned early on that we want to tailor findings and detections uh, to how our organization has our use cases, but also what is your threat model, risk appetite, and criticality for uh, protection of your data. Now, when we tailor these findings, these allow us to float the more impactful alerts to our organization to the top. So we're able to get um, eyes on incident and reduce the mean time to respond to a, a finding. We can use services like Security Hub to aggregate, organize, review, and prioritize these findings uh, from AWS and AWS partners uh, for furthering that response. And it allows us to create actionable uh, tasks based on that. So it allows us to detect and respond, allows us to triage and recover, and it raises the risk of uh, data exfiltration and or destruction uh, as mean times to increase to detect and respond. Now, addressing lack of continuous vulnerability management. Uh, when we're not maintaining software updates continuously, this is the common sources of compromises, such as the operating systems and the services, installed application software and their dependencies, or a lack of continuous deployment and integration, so CI CD pipelines. Taking that further, also having unmanaged systems and applications that have unrestricted access to the public internet introduces that risk. So the ways that we can prevent and detect this is performing continuous vulnerability analysis and management on what is hosting our applications, source code reviews, uh, so static analysis on your code repository or uh, linting prior to a successful commit. Also looking for secrets such as access key and a secret um, or other sensitive information that we wouldn't want to have within our application that is accessible beyond the team that was creating it. Now, ways we can look at this is, uh, as I mentioned, Amazon Inspector uh, can give us vulnerability management for uh, our running EC2 instances and give us an idea on how we can prioritize these findings. Looking at the VPC Reachability Analyzer will also give us an idea of how a resource can be accessed. Is it available publicly to the internet? Can it only be assessed, accessed from one VPC to another, um, or is it purely on a private subnet? And it helps us implement a defense in depth approach to restrict that discovery and exploitation. Now, falling in line with continuous vulnerability management, unmanaged applications and software. So for in-house open source um, and acquired software, we want to ensure that the software dependencies are being managed and ensuring that they're not susceptible to a security finding that may be published. Now I mentioned mitigating the OWASP top 10 for the secure coding practices will help us reduce the risk 
for those web apps that we may have published and hosted uh, that are facing the internet. But also then taking it a step further, how do we design that application uh, to be accessible to the public internet? We want to have some sort of broker such as a web application firewall or a firewall uh, load balancers. We want to ensure that we're also segmenting our applications as well. So we don't want to have, for example, our database directly accessible to the internet. We would want to have a three tiered architecture. So we have our web application that would communicate to the application layer. The application would then communicate to the database. We don't have the web tier communicating directly to the database tier. We want to maintain that blast radius should an event occur within our web application tier. And we do that by our segmentation and our defense and depth approach. So the next steps are, where do we go from here? We have core references available, uh, including the top 10 security items to improve your AWS account, the security pillar within the AWS well-architected framework. We have the security reference architecture, the incident response guide, as well as AWS security guides, including those open source tools that the customer incident response team has created and published on GitHub. For our call to action, we have the top 10 things that we want to cover. We want to ensure that we have defined cloud security strategy and an incident response plan, including the people, process, and technology for the cloud. Using email distribution lists for AWS account contact information to respond to AWS notifications instead of a potentially unmonitored mailbox or to a single individual will help us prevent the communications that are being sent outbound um, not being received or being able to be responded to. Creating backup plans for critical resources and data. And then periodically verifying that the data that is being backed up is accessible. What is your restore plan should you need to restore that data after an event? Implementing tools such as GuardDuty, AWS Config, Security Hub, CloudTrail, these all allow us to detect the different types of security event observables and aggregate them so we're able to look across our organizations and not have to go from one account to another account to another account, further increasing the response time to gather our artifacts to better contextualize the security event. And then using the AWS foundational security best practices to continuously assess for critical and high severities for common AWS resource configurations uh, will help us from the start with potentially lower impact um, address these security concerns to reduce the risk being introduced into the environment. Now, we also want to continuously assess for least privileged access using the IAM tools that we talked about replacing long-term credentials with short-lived credentials, utilizing role-based authentication versus IAM users, access keys, and secrets, mitigating the OWASP top 10, especially with input validation and rate limits, utilizing services like AWS WAF to front-end our web applications that are publicly exposed to the internet to sanitize uh, potentially anomalous uh, calls to our web application, ensuring that we patch the latest security patches for our OS applications and having a strategy of how to continuously update and make those continuously updated operating systems or AMIs available to our development teams, as well as ensuring that we're using secured and organizationally vetted AMIs and applications within our environment by ensuring we have a software inventory and then routinely train and simulate for these cloud security events to iterate and improve our processes. As we know that every process we have, we can continuously iterate and improve on to either shorten the time to respond or to potentially automate the process itself. Thank you very much. It's been a blast.